Uh, let's start. Hopefully it's recording. We'll see. So welcome. Uh, I'm glad that there are some people here. <laughs> Quite a lot. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Anza Horak. I'm working in Red Hat. I'm involved in uh, things uh, from containers through uh, Python, Ruby, databases, and also containers. So this talk will be about our experiences in containers development because uh, what we did in last one and a half year maybe uh, we had some nice set of collections uh, so generally uh, packages I won't talk about software collections much uh, in this presentation but uh, if you'll be interested you will see them so just uh, mentioning that uh, those packages were software collections in the beginning but we needed to produce containers that were fine for services like uh, uh, like platform as a service, um, especially Kubernetes and also OpenShift. But uh, at the same time, these uh, containers should be uh, usable on bare metal, on a classic uh, machine, or even atomic platform. So um, this is about sharing our. Uh, um, mistakes we did uh, so you don't repeat them and uh, I would like also to uh, propose some things that maybe uh, we'll get to uh, Adam's uh, guidelines uh, uh, also uh, maybe something that uh, some things that I would like to uh, make like a standard way of making containers in Fedora so let's see uh, so we will first uh, take a look at the Postgres container, then uh, some kind of a different container like Python container, some system containers as well, and tools containers. Uh, you'll see what I mean by that. Maybe you will have uh, another uh, opinions. Uh, so I would like to hear them. And uh, uh, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, just ask. Um, so uh, if I talk about containers, I usually mean dockering practice because that's uh, the only experience I have, but uh, I think most of the stuff will be valid for other implementations uh, as well. Um, and also some of the examples in the um, slides are not fully uh, working uh, because just, you know, for the sake of uh, being simple, uh, but there are some links in the end and during the uh, on, on the slides uh, that uh, where you can find uh, the working uh, working things because uh, there is the uh, there there is a couple of uh, repositories on Docker Hub under the SCL org namespace where you can find the uh, sources for the containers that we produced so far and they are really working fine. Uh, so first, uh, some very uh, basics about the containers. So. Who never uh, ran the Docker command? Is there anybody like that? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. So uh, we will be quite quick with in, in this uh, session. So uh, the containers. Uh, one <laughs> most important thing is that it's it's important what's inside, right? Uh, because. Uh, it's, it's, it's connected to the uh, design of the Linux containers. Uh, comparing to the virtual machine, I see Dan here, so uh, I remember him talking on DevConf uh, one and a half year ago and the uh, standing and repeating containers are not virtual machines. Uh, I remember that still. Uh, well, it's kind of a virtualization, uh, but there is a big difference in, uh, point in, in the um, security point of view, uh, so that if we have some Issue, security issue with the application or in the kernel or, or both. Uh, in the case of virtual machine, um, the attacker is usually stopped uh, somewhere in the hyper hypervisor, while in the containers uh, world, it's quite, uh, oh, it's, it's possible, not easy, but possible to uh, go through the host kernel, which is shared uh, with the host machine and also other containers. So the attacker can not only influence the other containers, but also influence the host itself. Uh, so yeah, container is not the virtual machine in that point of view. Uh, so let's uh, see what it means to build a container. So very simple container. We need uh, first to have the Docker uh, installed and running the daemon. Uh, then we can pull some base image. 
Uh, now uh, some theory about the containers. Well, the base image is usually produced by some distro. Uh, it's it's a very small uh, variant of the distro, so uh, we can find uh, basic libraries, uh, glibc and stuff. And uh, on top of this layer, we built some new layers. So for example, a layer with Apache and PHP. Uh, then we can um, create another thin layer on top of it with, for example, general, uh, general purpose uh, WordPress application. And what's important here, and it's quite nice, that uh, if we have uh, GLC, for example, in every uh, image available, it's stored only once because it's shared um, in all those layers. So the layers, uh, if there's a shared piece of them, um, yeah, they, they are stored only once in the, uh, on the hard disk, and uh, uh, we only store what is different in the layer above. Uh, then user comes and uh, pulls the, for example, um, WordPress image from the distro and creates own flavor, because uh, distro won't be able to create any well specific uh, application for its purpose, so configuration, or for example templates or some initial data. So it's also something we need to pay attention to. So in the end, we end with uh, uh, many many. Uh, containers produced by uh, distro and there are there will be another containers uh, <coughs> that will be created by uh, users to uh, fulfill their needs and that's quite important to um, um, realize that from the beginning that the content that, that, that the users will also build their own thin layers uh, so uh, back to the example of very very simple container we can uh, run the base image and uh, then running uh, some commands to create some content in this case just the one file and commit uh, such a container uh, so this is not the actually correct way to do things because such a build is not very repeatable uh, so or, or reproducible so uh, we can do it better uh, by writing the Docker file. So Docker file is something like RPM spec file for RPM, so it's just the recipe for creating containers. So doing the same as before, using the Docker file, uh, as simple as this, uh, and Docker build actually creates the container or container image. Um, so let's see something more usable. Uh, let's create the Postgres image. So we start with the uh, installation of necessary files. So in case of Postgres, it's of course the Postgres server image, sorry, package. Uh, uh, so we use uh, DNF call and we can build uh, the container. So we will see a log like this. And what is important here or interesting is that uh, every command in the Docker file creates own uh, layer, like intermediate layer. layer uh, we see it here and there, these ashes. Um, so it, it's good to keep the uh, uh, log uh, or the, the, uh, the number of layers uh, as little as possible. So uh, we have in the end small containers because if we imagine it like a git commit, if we store on the differences between the layers, it will be much bigger image in the end if we use a lot of uh, differences rather than if we use the uh, necessary uh, number of <laughs> differences. So uh, what, can we do uh, what we can do better is to create, to, to use uh, uh, all the uh, comments um, connected with at at. So it's only one command. That's one thing. Another thing is uh, we can use some DNF options like uh, no installing uh, documentation. I'm not sure how much uh, space we can save by that, but why not use it, right? And uh, what is uh, quite important is to clean the NF cache because <coughs> if we don't do it, even if or, or if we do it in another step, it would be still stored in the resulting image. Um, so this is the correct way to do it. Uh, so we can build it once, we can build it uh, twice with a slightly different thing. This is just uh, naming the resulting image uh, other than the hash. Uh, by the way, hashes are the unique way how to identify images in the Docker world. 
And we can see that the lock is quite different now. Um, and we see this, this uh, tricky thing using cache. Uh, so if you are building uh, images yourself, be careful about cache because <coughs> it can happen that you want to fix some vulnerability that's, that is uh, fixed already in RPM. You want to rebuild the image. And if you forget about the cache, uh, you can end up with a uh, container not updated. So uh, use either no cache 2 or you can use some tool for rebuilding or building images like uh, OpenShift build service or just OpenShift itself. Um, yeah, there are a couple of uh, possibilities. Or uh, I think Tomáš will be mentioning tomorrow a uh, few, few tools to build Docker, uh, Docker containers. And you heard today the uh, presentation about uh, OSBS, Open Chip Build Service by Adam Miller. So uh, another thing we can do is squashing uh, images. Uh, so it's again very similar to Git. Um, we have a couple of commits, and we want to have uh, produce the same output with just one commit. So that's the same purpose here. Uh, yeah, that's connected with these these intermediate. Uh, layers. So instead of having uh, a couple of them, we can produce only one layer directly uh, coming from the base image. And the base image here is the Fedora 24. So how we do it is uh, to install just uh, one package uh, called uh, obviously uh, Docker Squash and uh, using one command where we specify the base image and uh, the image we want to squash it will produce uh, one thin layer. Uh, so yeah, that's another thing, how, how we can make the container smaller. And what do you think? Is that all? <laughs> uh, well, actually we have Postgres in the container. Uh, but I wouldn't call that a container, uh, with, uh, or Postgres container, because if we talk about containers, we usually want to have some service running, microservice. Uh, so, uh, let's do some clever thing when user starts the container. So there is the concept of uh, default command. If the user runs the container with uh, no arguments, uh, we expect that something meaningful will happen. In this case, uh, we will run this, uh, this command. And it's actually the script that we edit online about. Um, so that's, that's the way how we do it. Uh, the script can look like this in case of Postgres. Uh, yeah, this is the example of uh, the simplified version. It's not all we included uh, we, we put there now, but uh, in the principle, we just initialize the database, create some uh, configuration, make the, the mm -hmm. mom listening on the network uh, devices, all the network devices, and then executing the Postgres itself. Uh, why executing and not uh, forking? Uh, well, there is a, well, there are a few reasons to it. First is that the signals uh, go uh, directly to the process. We also don't have two processes in the container, just one. Uh, but it has some uh, consequences, uh, like some processes, for example, don't gather Zumbi processes after forking. For that purpose, it's possible to use systemd in the container, so it can look similar to this. Uh, but again, such simple example just doesn't work yet. I'm not sure why, and <laughs> uh, it's probably just you know uh, systemd is not that uh, container uh, friendly. Uh, I don't know much details about this, but just mentioning that uh, something like that is possible. So. Why, you, uh, why we would like to run the systemd inside the container is uh, exactly, uh, well, as, as I mentioned, the zombies can be collected properly. Uh, we can work better with journaldy, and uh, yeah, it has some concept, uh, also um, uh, negatives that it's not that uh, easy to use right now. And I think it will need to run as a root. And I saw some systemd guys here, so maybe they will have some updates whether uh, it, it's it's more uh, well. What was the idea about running systemd in container? Whether it's something uh, you are working on or it's not on your plan. 
I can work in the system. Right now, you can run. If you run, if you install OCI system D hook and OCI registry machine, you can do exactly what you want there. Straight lines. Uh, so it's on the. Uh, okay. So was the directory you need to install some some other package or? There's, there's, okay. two, there's two packages called OCI system D hook and OCI registry machine. Uh -huh. I, I will hopefully write a blog within the week. Great. So <laughs> does that mean you can install <laughs> in the container or on the host? Okay. So thank you. That was what I was hoping to. <laughs> and uh, I was mentioning I was mentioning root access. Uh, so uh, uh, it's connected to the design uh, where we share the kernel with uh, other containers and host system. So even if there is some problem in the kernel, it's still better to run the process as a non-root uh, because you know if you have uh, permissions you don't need, you can uh, make more troubles or make more uh, problems. Uh, so another thing we should do is not run the container by default as root user if possible. Uh, we can do it like this, uh, just specify default user that container runs as uh, user can always um, use a specific uh, user ID to run the container so uh, it can be overloaded but default should be um, non-user um, and yeah we can build the container um, we can call it during, uh, during running it like so we don't need to use the hash for working with the container so then when we already have the container running we need to know where is the running right there is a internal IP address of the container this is how we can uh, find it and we can connect to the daemon so yeah we are almost there why almost uh, well, what's the password oh anybody has an idea red hat red hat no it's not red hat uh, actually yeah, one thing would be to use some default password, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, I know I know admins, they don't uh, remember <laughs> to change the password after deploying the service. So uh, this is the way how we use it uh, right now. We use uh, environment variable, which is specified by user when running the container. Uh, this is the uh, running script that we saw before. This is just the, uh, the changes we did. So first, some more configuration into the uh, Postgres config. Then we, during the container start, we start the daemon, but only listening on the local host, or sorry, the local port, uh, socket. Then we change the password of the Postgres user, which is like the admin user of the Postgres database. And then we stop the locally running daemon and continue normally, and in the end, exact the Postgres properly listening on all sockets. Uh, so we can run the uh, Postgres again. Um, we can connect to the uh, daemon. And now we already know the password because we specified the, the environment variable. So we can connect and it works well. Another thing I, I uh, saw recently is to uh, how, how to, because that's quite quite tough question, how to, or quite quite task, how to um, pass the password to the uh, container because if we do it like we saw uh, before the password is stored in plain text in the docker uh, daemon so if we do uh, for example docker inspect we can find out the password which might be some, like, sometimes usable but sometimes we don't want to uh, at, le at least in the plain text so another way how to pass the password to the daemon uh, is uh, passing some file uh, as a bind mount to the container and uh, obviously the uh, container needs to support you know, reading the password from this file. And yeah, I'm not sure which way is better from the security point of view, maybe supporting both ways and the user may decide. Uh, that's maybe something you can do. And uh, in the future I hope there will be some more sophisticated way like having a service uh, which will be running somewhere and a container would just ask for some, for example, token. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not security expert here, so I will let this to uh, you know, security uh, experts. The, the better way is to actually use secrets or something through an orchestration system. Yeah. 
OK, configuration, because uh, if you speak about databases, we often need to configure it, because nobody uh, likes to run you know, the default configuration database. Right? <coughs> so for example, uh, configuring max uh, connection uh, limit. Uh, this is the way how we do it. We just uh, grab the value from the environment variable again, and, and store it to the configuration. That's how, it's, uh, how it looks in the container. This is how it looks from the user's point of view. User is just required to specify it if he wants to change it. Otherwise, it will be the default one. Uh, this way is nice because um, it, it can look the same on the command line, on the atomic host, on, in the open shift. Uh, so the experience is the same. Um, so when we decide what option to support this way and which not, uh, well, we can just look at what are the most common options uh, for a particular image. Or it's better, or, 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 or we can just uh, let the, the rest uh, of the stuff to users. So users should be able to create a thin layer, as we speak at the beginning, uh, with their own configuration, for example, uh, some more complicated master-slave replication. You won't be able uh, to do it for them because they probably have some needs. Uh, so it should be just easy to uh, to do that. Uh, this is the thing that, or this is the implementation we are thinking about uh, right now. Uh, that there is a place where a user can bind mount or add some files in the thin layer. Uh, this place is usually um, well, uh, able to get the uh, the, uh, the path is able to get using the environment variable, so it's uh, not necessary to uh, hard code it. And the file can be as simple as this one liner. Uh, again, working with environment variables. Of course, there can be some hard coded uh, things in the configuration as well. It depends on the user. And uh, yeah, using such a simple Docker file, user will be able to create a thin layer. That's the the, the idea we had uh, <coughs> recently. Okay, uh, so the full working uh, container with the Postgres, or the, yeah, uh, container with Postgres uh, SCL is available on this address. So feel free to take a look. And now let's take a look at the Python container because it's kind of a different kind of uh, container, right? So it's not a service as uh, at least from the first side. Uh, so again, we can start from the very basic uh, Docker file. Uh, again, going from Fedora 4, installing the packages. Uh, anybody spotted something missing here? Here, clean. Yes, exactly, clean the cache. <coughs> and well, we are ready, right? <laughs> we have Python inside. We don't have anything like you know configuration for Python. It doesn't make sense much. Uh, we don't want to run Python interpret, or maybe we do, but uh, well, what user would do with such a container? Uh, he would probably create another thin layer every time uh, because he needs to put an application into the uh, container. So what he would need to do, and he can document this, uh, to write a thin like a Docker file. I see four lines there uh, with some installation script. Well, uh, and uh, yeah, it can take how much time? Ten minutes maybe to write a thin layer and, and build it. Um, so it, in case he uh, needs to build ten applications, it would be two hours maybe. Uh, so let's, let's help him a bit. Uh, so this was uh, the question, how, how to help users uh, to do something like that more efficiently. That was the question that uh, OpenShift guys was uh, were facing. And they produced a tool called source to, uh, source to image And the tool does pretty much it. <laughs> it, my, uh, it gives the source of the application to the image. And it can be used like this. And this uh, example does pretty much the same as the beginning, uh, as the previous one. It takes the application from the path, uh, 
into the and, and it, it gives it to the container called Fedora 5.5 and it will call the resulting image as the ST. And we can run it right after it. So what's happening inside? Um, how to produce a Python image that, su that supports this? Because uh, in order to work uh, fine, uh, okay. in order to make the uh, source image work mm -hmm. fine, we need to do something inside image. So what it is? Um, so what the source to image tool does is it uh, pulls or just gathers the application whatever it is, it may be a git uh, repository, so it will pull it, uh, it may be locally available application, so it will bind about it, and it will put it into this into some place, TMP source in this case, and then it will run the container with such an application in this place, and run the assembly script, and set another script called run as a standard and as a default command in, in the re, uh, resulting image. And then the container is committed. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that Docker commit is not a way to go <coughs> because it's, was, it was not reproducible. But in this case, we see that we can reproduce it uh, as many times as we want. So in this case, connecting Docker uh, container is quite, quite fine. Um, how the scripts look? Uh, so first the assembly image, as I said, this, this uh, script is uh, run <coughs> during, uh, inside the container, inside the Python container, and you see that there is the application copied from the known directory uh, to the actual uh, working directory, and there is some uh, specific uh, thing uh, to Python done. Uh, because that's, that's one thing uh, we should focus on. Like, if uh, users like to use requirements txt for specifying uh, requirements of uh, Python packages, let's just use them and install dependencies during this step. Instead of uh, uh, need to, uh, instead of that uh, the user would need to specify some install script uh, by himself. So there is some heuristic done. Uh, there is there's more stuff done uh, actually in the uh, assembly script you know, on the GitHub, but uh, this is just the uh, principle that we can do some you know estimation, some guesses. <coughs> the same for the RAM script. Uh, for example, we can take a look whether the application is actually a Django application, and if it is, uh, we can find the manage PI and uh, run the manage PI instead of a. Uh, uh, what is the standard way of running uh, Python? Like, I don't know, <laughs> uh, just the Python and, and the some script. Um, and as I said, this script is run when the resulting image uh, and the resulting container is being uh, started. Like, uh, as I uh, previously, uh, yeah, pre previously uh, showed the guest book as a resulting image. So when uh, user runs uh, Docker run best book this script will young. Uh, it's good to think to uh, use the frameworks that uh, users like, uh, as we saw with the Django example. Yeah, and this is the uh, final you know, final example with uh, just uh, GitHub uh, repository. Previously there was a, a locally, uh, install, locally available application. So it's this, as easy as this, so uh, it's good to uh, think about it, for example, uh, for other uh, frameworks, other languages, uh, usually provide something like that. But if you think uh, about the databases uh, as an application, so we can think about the configuration as a source code for the application, right? Because if you have a database and the configuration together it will make some particular deployment for example so we can support the source to image also for the databases containers as well uh, we, do, we, we would just put the configuration into the resulting image uh, in a similar way uh, again more information available you can see more and let's take a look at uh, another 
kind of containers. So I call them system containers. I'm not sure whether uh, this namespace is still free. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if uh, anybody will understand it like, m much differently, just tell me because I might need to change the uh, wording. So what I uh, you what I call the system containers is a container which is running uh, via system D on your machine or your laptop or uh, bare metal, uh, doesn't matter, uh, just instead of the process. So we just replace the process uh, via the, with the container. Why we need to do it or why we want to do it? Well, we, we can just uh, slowly moving from just slowly moving from the traditional system to the containerized system so we can move one service uh, by another this way or we can just you know uh, try to use some some random daemon and we don't want to uh, break our system so another another reason why I can uh, use this approach and how we can do it um, so we need first to uh, create the container but uh, we use docker create in this case and not uh, running the container we just create it and it's stopped by, uh, after this then we create uh, unit files in the unit file for uh, such a service and instead of starting the process directly as, as usual we just use docker and start and in the end we just uh, you know we can just work with the container as, as expected so again, it's, it's possible, it's working quite uh, straightforward. Uh, but again, it's, it's quite a lot of stuff. You no know, user would need to write all this. <coughs> so there is a better way to go. It's uh, called atomic command. Uh, and the atomic command is not only used for working with, working with containers, it's also uh, used to work with the uh, RPM OSTRI uh, system. Like it, it, it should be the tool number one in this uh, kind of system but it, it can help in this case so um, what what we can manage to do with the atomic command line tool uh, we can uh, do all the first steps I mean the creating the container and uh, creating and enabling the system the service via uh, one uh, command only so users won't need to write the unit files by themselves. Uh, it will be all uh, packaged in the, in the container and using the atomic labels, uh, the container would just support <coughs> this kind of calling and during this call, you know, everything will uh, happen automatically. Uh, it's documented here, so I won't just repeat it. Uh, it's it's uh, to be too long to uh, go deeper. But uh, I just wanted to mention that something like that is possible and it's working quite fine. Um, whether we uh, support the uh, atomic call in our containers, well, not yet. Um, and it's because uh, it's, it's not very usable for the application containers. Uh, that's why this is included in the system containers uh, <coughs> section. So yeah, <laughs> that was our resolution like a year ago. Um, so yeah, it, because we didn't see much point to uh, uh, let users to run the application containers with the atomic command if the docker command works the same. Well, uh, tools containers. Uh, it's not containers tools. It's not. It, these are not tools to run or manage containers. It's uh, these are containers with tools inside. Uh, so what it can be. For example, tools to manage demons. Uh, obviously, the demon with database should include only the necessary stuff to run the demon. But we, for example, want to uh, work with the database uh, uh, more efficiently, so we need more tools. Uh, so we can package all the tools in a separate container. And when we package something into two containers, it's always tough point to connect to those put to, uh, to, to these two containers. So, in this case, it's quite easy because we have the daemon running on some network device, uh, so we can just connect to it and uh, we can work with the uh, utility 
just as a normal, uh, yeah, quite quite uh, quite normal. Like you can also run bash here and uh, run the uh, MySQL MySQL DB copy in a bash. Uh, so yeah, this is quite straightforward. But there are uh, more interesting stuff you can package into containers. For example, the build tool chain. Uh, so when you want to build something in an environment of a container, you can do something like that. Uh, package all the building tools uh, into a container and then uh, well, either bind mount the all, all the host, host in, into the container so it's accessible. Or, well, how it could be done differently. Uh, yeah, you can just bind mount the for example, just the application um, directory, so you know the tools from the container can access it. Um, or we can also run some system tools uh, into the container. So, for example, uh, the performance tools can be uh, or just uh, packaged as a container. But in this case, it would be quite challenging to run the container appropriately because these tools need some special permissions and uh, system capabilities. Uh, again, I, I don't know much details, but uh, what I know is that these such, such containers, when we, want, when we want to run, for example, the performance tools need to run as privileged and even maybe super privileged. So it means uh, run, for example, uh, quite long uh, command line or Again, the atomic tool can help here. Um, again, the container with such tool can uh, have the atomic labels set, and the atomic command itself already supports the SPC uh, option, so it can help here as well um, automatically. So this is how it looks in case of uh, atomic call. Uh, it makes uh, uh, it works, or it does the same thing as the previous command, uh, and you see these three dots uh, that it was not even all. <laughs> I don't want. <laughs> I lost mouse. Sorry. <laughs> Does anybody saw my mouse? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <a little different>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, and another thing, uh, quite weird from the first side, but it's possible to run also desktop applications in Docker. Uh, I'm not sure whether something as, as easy as, or as simple as this will work, but well, I don't say you should run it, you should try it, because for desktop applications, there is a better container <coughs> technology. Uh, you might already heard it today. Flatpak is specially designed for running uh, desktop applications uh, in containers. So rather than hacking uh, something like this, I, I would try to uh, suggest you to look at Flatpak. By the way, as you Linux will block everyone in your examples too. So <laughs> okay. You'd have to disable us if it's in line. All right. Uh, and some unsorted uh, ideas in the end. Uh, because uh, when we started to build the containers, uh, we realized that it's not only about the writing the Docker file itself. Uh, it's also about the infrastructure. Uh, because when I when I uh, talked about uh, the the design, uh, for example, in case there is some security issue in GC, it never happened, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, except February, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> what happened um, was that we needed to uh, include the security uh, fix in the GLIPC, so in the base image, it was quite easy to rebuild such an image. But since uh, all the other layers are sharing the GLIPC image uh, with the base image, we need to rebuild all the upper layers. And again, for the upper layers again, and even for the users uh, containers, they also shouldn't sh should reboot their containers uh, after there is some you know, uh, update in the base image. 
and you can imagine that there will be a lot, a lot of contaminants, and, and it, it's actually the case. So, um, but still, we should do it because once we forget, for example, about something, it not only makes the one container broken; it will obviously uh, mean that all all the upper layers are broken as well, <coughs> or at least not vulnerable. vulnerable. <laughs> um, so. You should automate it. That's the thing we learned quite fast that it's not possible to do this uh, manually. So we should automate the building. Uh, the OSBS can help uh, with this because it supports or it will support uh, automatic rebuilding. But again, I mentioned that uh, it shouldn't stop at the level of um, distro images. We should also have some you know utilities or, or some service to rebuild even the users uh, containers it might be copper might be something else I don't know and when we do something automatically or automatically <laughs> uh, we should also test the result and that's also one thing that we learned and I'm very happy about having some automatic testing there uh, because when we rebuild something uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, in the Docker world, it's, it's quite easy to test the resulting image because Docker itself is quite a uh, fine tool uh, to run the resulting image. It's not like in uh, the RPM world. It's not easy to install the RPM uh, on the same you know, uh, machine as, as we build it. For example, because of the system D, you know, we need the root for it and stuff. For the Docker, it's quite, uh, quite fine to run it. So this is the example of uh, the repository as I would like to see it once uh, in the Fedora, like in the disk, for example, that except the Docker file and some supported, uh, supporting files, you would also and always have some test uh, together, together with the uh, image source because if we want to store it somewhere else, uh, there will be uh, some, or it will be quite tough to have it in sync because we, if you change something, you know, uh, you would have to change the test. <coughs> and yeah, and, and running the test would be as simple as this. Uh, right after the building, could, we could run the uh, test script. Uh, the test script is not hard to write. This is a very short, uh, very very simple example how to write this test for the, for example, MySQL daemon. Uh, so in the principle, we just uh, run the resulting daemon, resulting container. We find out the network uh, address and then in the loop because um, uh, the daemon starts, uh, well, starting procedure, it takes a uh, few seconds. So we wait uh, until there is some something, well, something reasonable happening. And if not, we just print logs because it's quite common that you want to have uh, at least some uh, idea what is happening uh, if it doesn't work, right? <laughs> um, what else we can check uh, in the script? Uh, well, maybe even generally somewhere else, it, this doesn't need to be necessary in the container specific test. We can check whether all the packages are signed. Uh, we can check, for example, labels. Uh, if we expect them uh, to be present. We can check whether the image uses the latest uh, base image. We can check documentation, error supported during, uh, during the build. Uh, in case of software collections, we uh, check whether the software collection is enabled uh, by default. And you, you can also check the API. Uh, and now what I mean by the API, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure, again, whether uh, someone would uh, understand the container API the same as me. So what I understand uh, is the container API is everything which other users or consumers of the image can depend. Uh, so we identified that it can be obviously something that they directly use uh, for creating their own containers. For example, the path to the script, which adjusted uh, uh, the, uh, the the original container or it can be uh, 
paths to volumes because they use it in their scripts, right? Or configuration. It can be ports, um, um, or at least the default port that the service is running on, or even the uh, default commands, or actually all commands that are available in the, in the uh, image. And we should not only keep those unchanged, or at least think about the API and if there are some changes needed, so at least think about what is the you know um, consequences. Uh, what are these consequences for users? We should also try to make all the images the same because, um, well, obviously, uh, for example, uh, MySQL database and MariaDB database, it's usually run the same, like at least in the RPM world. So it makes sense to use the same approaches here as well. Uh, so things that we identified and we try to use the same uh, in all the containers we produce is, for example, using USR uh, instead of US, uh, user local. Uh, for example, paths uh, we try to stage with or use the expected paths uh, with, uh, which are used usually in the RPM ports. Again, uh, using the standard ports for the service, and the same works for the default user. But for example, for the Python container, there is obviously no um, default user. Uh, there is nothing like Python user uh, in the system. So we just uh, started to use uh, 1001 uh, from some reason. I don't recall one <laughs> which. But uh, again, well, it doesn't matter what it's actually chosen, but uh, it's good to think to uh, use that in, in all the uh, services consistently. And for that purpose, uh, there was created the Container Best Practices Guide. Uh, the source of the guide is on the GitHub, so it's uh, very open and um, it's, it's uh, waiting for um, some pull requests. Um, and at least, well, you can take a look what was uh, so far identified as a, as a best practice when creating containers. Um, so that's all I wanted to share. Uh, just a quick check. Does anybody remember some of the tips? At least one. Don't use root. Yeah, don't use root. Don't use root. Don't use Thanks. Yeah, a uh, few that I uh, like, and uh, I, I would like you maybe to remember, uh, if you remember only some of them. So yeah, content is important. Don't use root. Allow users to extend the images because they will do it uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, support atomic uh, command line tool and automate, automate, automate. And so, yeah. um, there's one issue uh, with not running processes root inside containers: volumes. Okay, can you, exp uh, can you expand uh, what? Do you um, mean? Only the root inside the container actually has any permissions on any mounted volumes that you find mounted in the container. And if you don't start the container as root, you can't change those permissions. Right, yeah. So if the process you want to run as non-root requires specific permissions on a directory within a bind mounted volume, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, but still, uh, you have to some change, some you have to change the UID of the files you mounting into. So his example where he's expecting 1001, you'd have to show 1001, 1001, whatever you're going to volume out. Yeah, does the well, you'd have to do that in the external on the host, then. Right. No, no. Yeah, that's the way we use <laughs> <laughs> And there is the user namespace uh, yeah. available now, so if... User namespace is not going to feel that wrong. No. Really? The, okay. Um, so what people yeah. usually do is actually they have like an entry point where they dynamically change UID of the user running inside a container based on maybe something classed as an environment variable. And they would use a special tool like GoSu. So oh, right. you can create an extra process. If you, you would use your general su. Yeah, Sudo. except that we don't have GoSu available as a package, uh -huh. so. Okay. Yeah. But if you use the time we install the Build the smart set to change the UID outside on the volume to come down to the next 
Yeah, but in many cases it's not necessary. So in many cases you can yeah. actually yeah. run as non root. There is a there is a patch to change the UID of the volume that's been stuck in the Docker world for years and years. So mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the comments. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to download the, the presentation, it's already available. Uh, I just forgot to show the QR code. <laughs> and any other questions? We have no other minutes. <laughs> <so. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 